Today, I'm going to walk you through Stripe's Amazon S3 journey and how we started using some of these tools and best practices that Gail and Andrew have shared with you today on how we achieve some of those savings and some of our learnings along the way. But first, it's important to understand how does Stripe actually use S3? Well, millions of companies from the world's largest enterprises to the most ambitious startups use Stripe to accept payments, grow their revenue, and accelerate new business opportunities. At Stripe, we have just a few S3 buckets, but thousands of prefixes within those buckets. And we process half a billion API requests a day, sometimes over 10,000 API requests a second. All of that data results in hundreds of petabytes of data in S3. And most of that data is just concentrated in just a few S3 buckets. So that's hundreds of petabytes of data in just a handful of buckets. So to simplify the lives of our developers, we offer an abstraction layer to make it really easy to use S3 while also upholding security, not giving everyone access to the AWS console. Our journey with S3 began over a decade ago when Stripe began using AWS. As Andrew mentioned, we started using standard tiering. And in 2018, we started experimenting with intelligent tiering to look at how we could optimize our costs and organize our data. In 2021, though, when S3 had introduced the archive instant access tier, we realized we could actually go and take the next step forward. We could save a lot of money still using intelligent tiering with no change in code, no worries about throughput. So we moved over 90% of our data into intelligent tiering at 30% of the cost. But at hundreds of petabytes of data, that wasn't enough for us. So earlier this year, we began experimenting with deep archive access. Now, we need to figure out how to actually move data into deep archive access. What data can we move? So we have a data candidacy constraint. Of course, anything that our users might rely on to retrieve instantly, well, we don't want to upset the user experience, so we probably won't move that data into deep archive access. We'll keep that one in a hotter tier. We also, being a payments company, have a lot of compliance obligations to meet, so we don't want to touch any data that's going to change any of those processes. Additionally, with hundreds of petabytes of data, we want to uphold that developer productivity lens as well. If the process is effective, we can encourage moving more of our data into S3 objects to Glacier to deep archive access without having a costly or burdensome uphill battle to do so. So what can we actually move into deep archive access with these constraints? Well, what we wanted to figure out was what part of our data is actually growing the most? What is costing us the most or has the potential to start costing the most over time? And looking at S3 storage lens, usage reports, and access logs, we looked at that our build artifacts and our latency data is probably the best candidates. At Stripe, we store all of our latency profiles over time. We do this so that we could validate any new software that's going out, measure performance, improve latency over time so we could have a great user experience along with our five nines of availability. And we also go ahead and store all of our software artifacts that were ever deployed, even if they're no longer in use. And we do this to validate the correctness of software or in the event that something's not matching our expectation in a compliance inquiry, we could go ahead and validate what happened at that time. Now, this data we consider rare use. When we have these experiments where we need to rerun a latency profile or look at a previously deployed software artifact, it's not something that pops up every day for us, not even every sprint. So rare use, something that we don't really expect developers to be doing every day. And typically, these aren't things that have a very short time horizon. We could actually wait six months, let S3 intelligent tiering move this data into deep archive access after 180 days of it not being accessed, and we'll be totally okay. So it's a pretty basic formula on what can move into deep archive access. Not access very, very frequently, or at all, and rare use. Some one-off use case that we have to go and respond to. Those, that's the type of data we would move into deep archive. And then how do we uphold developer productivity? Well, our abstraction layer, which is effectively a microservice that helps control permissions and secure access, we maintained it. Before this, it accepted a prefix or a list of objects. And after, that was the same exact input we'd, we'd uh, taken so that our developers had an easier time to use. It simplified the head and restore operations, 
so that we wouldn't have to go and rethink how to use S3 regardless of what tier that our objects reside in. And as a result, over 10% of our data we had moved this year into deep archive access. Earlier this year, we had a large audit restore request. And because of, our exp of expanding our abstraction to handle the batch restore operation, we were able to complete that large audit restore well ahead of the deadline without late developer hours, without having to think about how to actually grab this data, without having to worry about whether or not we're grabbing the right data. We're also learning along the way that the combination of S3 intelligent tiering and deep archive access is better providing us, it's providing more understanding of how our data is managed and how we might wanna think about even deleting some of that data, that that we don't need to hold on to. So we've learned that data storage is cheap until it isn't. S3 offers a lot of ways, as you've just heard, on how to actually maintain data at a pretty reasonable and competitive rate. But at hundreds of petabytes, if your data is just sitting there, you're not touching it, that does add up over time. So we need to revisit our storage assumptions. The decisions we made a year ago, two years ago, five years ago, those were all correct. They were right, hey, we might need this data in the future. We don't quite know what to do with it, so it's safer to hold on to it. We went ahead and did that. But where that data is actually managed, how we went ahead and setting that up, those are the types of things we want to revisit. And with S3 intelligent tiering and deep archive access, they both provide a way for us to understand our data, still meet our compliance needs, but archive data that's not necessary at just a fraction of the cost, saving us tons of money over time. 